All right, this is the pre-video for Thursday of this week on sections 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3. Um, we're going to be looking at some characteristics of functions and how derivatives are going to help us determine some of those things if a picture is not in front of us. So the first thing we're just going to focus on in these videos is just what, is, what does this look like? What are we talking about? Um, how does it look, look like that on a graph? Because if you understand that, then when you're using the derivatives, it helps you see what we're going to be figuring out. So for section 3.1, we're talking about increasing and decreasing functions. And an increasing function is when, as you move from left to right on your x-axis, your graph is going higher in the y values. And a decreasing function is as you go from left to right with your x values, the graph is getting gains, the y's are getting smaller and smaller. So this is just the formal definition of how can we test for increasing and decreasing. Um, I'm going to read that to you in a minute, but I want you to see this. This is a decreasing function up to this point, which we labeled as A. From A to B, this is constant, which means not rising or changing at all. Um, and then for the rest of the graph, it looks like we're increasing or going uphill. So it says if you have your first derivative and you've already figured that out, if you set it equal to zero or greater than zero or less than zero, that will tell you when the function's increasing or decreasing or constant. Now we'll have a table to test for this, um, and you'll see that in a little minute when I get to section, I think, 3.2. Um, but it says, you know, it, you're either going to be increasing or decreasing or constant, depending on which of these three scenarios you see when you solve your first derivative. Okay, so let's just look at some pictures and let's talk about how can we tell increasing and decreasing estimated from a picture. So if you notice right here on my picture, I'm going to do yellow for decreasing. So from negative infinity up to negative two, this graph is going downhill. And that's a little too wide, so let me back that up. Let's do a little bit less thickness. Okay, so from, still not quite right. There we go. So from negative infinity up to negative two, this graph was going downhill. It's also going downhill from zero to uh, positive one. And I, th I think I said negative two, this is negative one. So we can estimate, yeah, because this guy right here is negative one. We can estimate where we're decreasing by looking at just how the shape of the graph is behaving. So we are decreasing from negative infinity to negative one, unioned with zero to one. And these values right here are x-axis values. So it's all dependent on what's happening in your domain. Now I'm going to use blue for the other version. So let's make that a little thinner. And from negative one to zero, this graph was going uphill. See, it's headed uphill. Also from positive one to infinity, this graph is heading uphill again. So it's increasing. So this graph is increasing from negative one to zero, unioned with one to infinity. So we can tell visually, if we've got the graph in front of us, we can tell when we're increasing or decreasing without needing the derivative at all. But something to note about this is that when we were decreasing, we would have had tangent lines that had negative slope. And when we were increasing on our graph of our function, we would have had tangent lines that had positive slope. Um, so for this one, it looks like negative two is one of the marks where we change positions right here. And at positive two, again. So from, let's see, decreasing and increasing, doesn't matter which one I write first, but increasing is negative infinity to negative two, I'm headed uphill. And from two to positive infinity, I'm also headed uphill. And from negative two to two, the graph is headed downhill from left to right. So that's just from a picture, so that's not too bad. Now, this is not going to quite get us into how to do this with the derivative yet. This is just the first step of that process. But when you are trying to figure out where you're increasing and decreasing and you don't have a graph in front of you, then we learned that um, critical numbers are places where there's interesting stuff happening in our graph. So continuous functions can change signs only where the function is equal to zero or is undefined. So therefore functions change from increasing to decreasing when the derivative is equal to zero or undefined. The x values where the derivative equals zero or is undefined are called critical values. Now, we're not going to deal with any undefined ones in our uh, pre-video. We'll talk about that in class. 
we're just going to deal with some polynomials real quick. So it says, if I want to find the critical numbers of a function, I need to take my derivative of that function, set it equal to zero, and solve for any x's, or they're calling them c's, essentially for critical number, that would make that happen. If you had x's in your denominator, you would then, or you know, a square root or something, you would also ask, where's your derivative undefined? So, um, you know, certain things will go wrong sometimes, and we have to talk about where is the derivative not defined, and that also um, can cause an issue for increasing or decreasing. So first one right here, we're going to take f prime of x. This would be 6x squared minus 18x, and then to find your critical numbers, you set that equal to zero and try to factor and solve. So nothing too crazy, so set it equal to zero. I can pull out a 6x out of that pair, that would leave me with an x minus 3. I set each of those equal to zero, just like solving an equation. So x equals zero and x equals positive 3 are the possible critical numbers for this fu original function. Um, and what that means is those are places where we possibly could change from increasing to decreasing. Um, all right, so f prime of x of this one would be 2x minus 1, set that equal to 0, and this time there's only one possibility for a critical number, and it happens at 1 half. So finding critical numbers is not too bad. You just have to take the first derivative, set it equal to 0, and if there's for any reason anything in a denominator, you'd also have to talk about when is the derivative um, possibly undefined. All right, so that takes care of section 3.1. We'll talk about the rules of doing the test for that next time in class. 3.2 is what was the purpose of taking that first derivative and finding those critical values. And extrema and the first derivative test is what comes up. We're only going to do um, this first example. We'll leave the first derivative test and everything for class. So it says the points at which a function changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, that is when a function has a relative extrema. A relative extrema is either a relative minimum or a relative maximum of the function. Um, it doesn't have to be the highest or lowest point of the whole entire function, it's just in a small interval, it's the biggest or the smallest. Um, so for a continuous function, the relative extrema will occur at the critical number. So if your function can be graphed without picking up a pencil, which a polynomial can, your relative extrema have to happen at those critical numbers of the function. Um, so find all relative extrema of this following function. Now notice they have pictures here. If it changes from increasing to decreasing, it's a maximum. If it changes from decreasing to increasing, it is a minimum. Now the way I organize this for um, students is we make a chart, just so you have a place to show all your work. It'll be very similar to something we did in the first unit. So the first thing we do is we take our first derivative and we're gonna find those critical values. So this would be six x squared minus 6x minus 36, and then that would be a 0. I would set this equal to 0, and I'm going to go ahead and pull out a 6, because I know that is a GCF for all of those terms. I would then factor if I can, and this looks like it factors into minus 3 and plus 2. Multiplies to negative 6, but adds to negative 1. 6 does not give me a critical value because it does not have an x attached to it. So I know I have two critical values of positive 3 and negative 2. So if I was going to graph this polynomial, I would expect ordered pair that starts with the number 3 and an ordered pair that starts with the negative 2 to be those relative maximums and minimums. So the way I'm going to figure out which one is which um, is, or if they're both maxes for some reason, you know, that usually doesn't happen, but um, not when you just have two. I'm going to make a chart like we did in Math 136. I put my critical numbers at the top of my two chart uh, separators. I would call this interval negative infinity to negative 2, and this interval negative 2 to 3, and this interval 3 to infinity. I'm going to pick a test value for each region, so something in that region, so maybe negative 4, 0, and maybe positive 4. And then here's the different part. So I'm not going to plug these back into the function unless I want to know what the ordered pair is because that would tell me like what is the ordered pair for the max or the min. To figure out if this is going to be a max or min, you need to plug them into your first derivative. That's the important piece here. So my first derivative is 6 times x minus 3 times x plus 2. So that's what I'm going to plug each of these into. 
and we don't even care if the number is like 50 or negative 5. We just care if it's positive or negative. So we're not even going to worry about what the number actually comes out to. We're just going to ask what's the sign of each of these. So this first guy is definitely positive because it's just a 6. If I plug in a negative 4, I'm going to get a negative for the second parentheses and a negative for the third parentheses. So this is a positive times a negative times a negative. So that comes out as an overall positive. And I'll tell you what that means in just a second, but that's a plus. And then if I plug in zero, I still have positive because that's a six. I have negative three and then I have a positive two. This comes out as an overall negative. This right here, if I plug in four would be, um, oops, this would be positive, 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 and three positives multiply to make a positive. So let me explain what you've just found. And this is something we do over and over again. If you test your, if you test on each side of your critical numbers and you plug those test values into your first derivative, that tells you the slope of the tangent line in that specific region. So if you have a slope of a tangent line that is positive, that means your slope is going uphill. That means your region is increasing. If you have a negative slope overall in the region, that means your region is decreasing. So this actually goes increasing, decreasing, increasing, just like the picture kind of up here. Now, to tell if these are max or mins, you have to look at the change across the line. So from one side of negative two to the other side of negative two. This goes increasing to decreasing. That means that that guy is a hilltop, it's a max. This goes from decreasing to increasing. So that means this is a minimum or a valley. So I would write that I have a relative max at x equals negative 2. It has to be at the critical value. And I have a relative min at x equals 3. Now we'll get a lot more specific in class. We'll actually find the ordered pairs associated with those. But right now we're just making sure we understand how to find those extreme values. All right, and then the last part of this pre-video is going to be a little thing in section 3.3. Let me scroll on down to that. Called concavity and the second derivative essentially. So when we talk about concavity, we're talking about the way the curve is kind of facing. Um, I like to think of it as is a bowl facing upward or is a bowl facing downward. This is called concave up. And this is called concave down. And it doesn't have to be this extreme. It can be very slight. Like it could just be like this. This is concave down. And then at some point it sort of flips and becomes concave up because now the ball looks like it's flipping up kind of right around here. So, you know, when we talk about concave up and concave down, the only thing we're going to cover in this pre video is how to tell it from the second derivative. So it says, when drawing a graph of a function, it helps to understand the regions where it is increasing as well as the graph's concavity. Concavity is the property of curving upward or downward. So a graph f, to, what we're doing is we're saying we're taking the second derivative to check this, but it's telling us about the behavior of f. So your graph f is concave up when your first derivative was increasing or your second derivative was greater than zero. The graph of f is concave downward when f prime is decreasing or f the second derivative is less than zero. Um, so just a quick test, uh, well let me show you the pictures first. It says um, a curve that is concave upward lies above its tangent lines. Remember we talked about how sometimes your graph when you draw the tangent lines they're below the graph. If you're concave downward your tangent lines are drawn on top of the graph. So that's kind of an interesting relationship to that. Um, so determine the open intervals on which the graph of f of x equals 5x to the fourth minus 20x is concave up or down. So I don't care about increasing or decreasing here. I'm only asking you about concavity. So that means concavity means take two derivatives. So if we're only asking about this, we need to get f double prime of x. So let's go ahead and take the first derivative because you can't get the second derivative without already taking the first. That is 20x to the third minus 20. And then f double prime of x would be 60x squared and then no, uh, no 20 since that's derivative would be zero. So we set that equal to zero just like we did when we were finding critical numbers. Um, this has a different definition and we'll tell you what this means in a second. We're just checking for that critical where does this equal zero. Um, and since it's just times x, it's going to be the only place it equals zero is at zero. 
So we'll formally define what this is called, but this is just uh, the test for concavity. You put the value that made the second derivative equal zero on the top of your chart, and you go from negative infinity to that number, from that number to infinity. If there's more than one of these, obviously we would split it up. We get a test value. I'm gonna say negative two and two for the two regions. And the key here is if you're checking for concavity, you're checking it in the second derivative. So 60x squared, 60x squared. So if I plug in negative two here, this is a positive times a positive, because anything squared is gonna be positive. So this is an overall positive. And if I plug in two here, 60 is still positive, x squared will still come out positive. So this is also a positive. Anywhere you get a plus overall for your test region, that means that whole region is concave up. And this is also positive, so it would be concave up as well. If it was going to be a region where we would have concave down, we would get a negative sign overall. So this would just be concave up all the way from negative infinity to infinity. So it's concave up everywhere. Um, so we'll see some more variations of these in our notes that day in class. So that's it for the next week. Um, so that's all of the pre-videos. Make sure you guys take good notes. I'll be checking um, each of those on Tuesday and Thursday respectively. So have a good weekend.